Debt Man Tolkien. Tonight's show is another exclusive story from the incredible mind of Edward Ed Smith. And as ever, please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. Uh, why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled Feel the Burn. Let's get straight into that. Specialist Jeremy A. Higgs was awakened by the fire guard, along with other trainees. You see, Higgs, after about three years of hard work in the U.S. Army as a combat engineer, has finally got a slot in the Army's elite engineering training school, and he is now training to be a sapper. Upon completion, he will be awarded a red tab to wear on his uniform, just like the Rangers or Special Forces graduates. A sapper, also called a pioneer or combat engineer, is a combatant or soldier who performs a variety of military engineering duties, such as breaching fortifications, demolitions, bridge building, laying or clearing minefields, preparing field defences, and road and airfield construction and repair. Within three years of his date of graduation, he would go on to attend Ranger Assessment and Selection Program and was assigned to the 3rd Ranger Battalion at Fort Benning, Georgia. The specialist, now Sergeant Higgs, was well on his way to becoming a career soldier that he always wanted to be. While on deployment, Sergeant Higgs was injured in a Black Hawk helicopter crash and injured his right knee, his left shoulder and cracked seven of his ribs. After a long and painful recovery, it was determined that he was eligible to be medically discharged and retired, and he thought he would never use his training again. But little did he know that the training he received over 20 years would now save his life. After Jeremy left the army, he began his life. He went to school to the university, obtained his degrees and moved on towards life. However, his personal life was in shambles after a string of girlfriends and three failed marriages and two kids that really don't ever talk to him. He had settled into as no more life as he could get. His days spent at work and sometimes on the road, but mostly at the gym, where he could always find an outlet for whatever stress the day has brought him. Powerhouse Gym was built about two years ago and was as far as gyms go, a masterpiece of exercise wonderment. The owners really thought of everything that you could ever want in a fitness center. Hammer Strength is the main brand of push-pull machines to the commercial grade peloton cycles and treadmills. The rock climbing wall was a 100 foot wonder and some 190 foot wide. It was the largest in the state and all indoors. The combative area that would accommodate boxing and mixed martial arts training was world class. The free weight area was the most impressive of all, or there were some 85,000 pounds of free weights in and of themselves, and somehow they found a way to build an indoor running track that wove itself throughout the three and four story facility and even up onto the roof where the users could enjoy their runs inside a covered enclosed causeway that travelled the perimeter of the massive roof. One lap equaled one-sixth of a mile. And what made it so unbelievable? Well, it was in Jeremy's little podunk town. The owners moved to this town because one of them grew up here, and they wanted to have a business that would help the community as well as make them a living. Now, they knew it wasn't going to make them rich, but they decided to use their retirement savings and borrowed less than 15% to build this impressive facility. And what made it so affordable is the location of the gym. It was located three quarters of a mile outside the city limits and was graded out into a swampy area that was backed up to the wildlife refuge and management area. 92 dump truck loads of dense clay, boulders and concrete debris were utilized and with a several dozen steel foundation piers. The dream of the mother of all gyms took shape. Construction took 14 months and was about 8% over budget. The trees, brush, swamp and marsh were pushed back from the rear of the building, only about 30 feet. Then the old growth of the swamp exists as a backdrop to the parking area in the rear of the site. It's about 8 feet above the normal level of water 
and even at high floods, there was still three feet of clearance from the surface of the paved area. Water moccasins are commonly seen slithering across the paving and have been spotted in the storm drains built into the parking area and hanging from the tree canopy that still covers part of the pavement. Nature well, is never that far away out here. Several weeks prior to this night, Janice Wolfer told Jeremy that she felt like someone was watching her through the window while she was riding a spin bike that sits next to one of the windows at the rear of the facility. He told her to come get him when she was ready to leave and he would walk her to a car. And well, it must have been one hell of a walk because Jeremy got a date out of the deal. And well, it was nice to feel the touch of someone who cared at least for a while. Today is just like every other day that Jeremy comes into the gym. After work, well, it's late in the evening. More like early morning. The gym's sparsely crowded. Maybe two or three people other than him. While he was in the locker room changing, as the other members of the gym had finished up their workout cycles, and they're getting ready to leave or have already left. Within 20 minutes of finishing up his warm-up on the treadmill, he was alone in the facility. Well, it was just after 2 a.m. and he had another two hours ahead of him. Sleep was elusive for Jeremy, and sometimes it would be days before he would lay his head down. Some things in your life you're just not ready to admit to. Tonight would be another one of those things that would remain with him for the rest of his life. Now, Jeremy was in his last 30 minutes of his cycle, when the leg press machine was well in front of him. The 192 rep package was going to be a killer. The leg workout area was situated at the rear of the facility, and the windows looked out over the rear parking area, and the tree line that led to the marshy swamp. And the windows were floor to ceiling, and were constructed out of two foot wide by three and a half foot tall sections that were held in place by a heavy metal frame. The glass was impact resistant because of the violent thunderstorms that happened in this part of the country. And the one light that illuminated the rear parking area had been flickering and flashing on and off for the last four or five weeks. It really was nothing new. And when it was on, it lit up the entire rear area. But when it was off, it was pitch dark. And in between one of his 48 rep sets, he would go over to the window and use the metal frame as a handhold so he could stretch his legs so that in the next set, he would not cramp up. But while he was stretching his thighs, the light was flashing on and off. He noticed nothing out of the ordinary until during one of the flashes. He glanced at the tree line and in an instant he thought he saw a figure. A shape. A shadow. But in the next flash, whatever it was, well, it was gone. He just shook it off as just a play of the light and continued his workout. After the next 48 rep cycle, he was stretching again using a window frame. Even while he was performing his leg presses, the light was flashing. Jeremy didn't see anything out of the ordinary, and there was a longer than normal pause between flashes. And while his face was mere inches away from the pane of the glass, the light flashed, and there, in front of him, 20 inches from his nose, was the large head of a wolf. But this, well, this was off the ground by about nine feet. He screamed and pushed back from the window frame, the beast cocked his head to one side and then, with its muzzle, it seemed to bump the glass and snort on the glass, fogging the area of the glass pane. And then it roared and stared with anger at him. And that is when the feeling of loathing, dread and utter terror swept over him and he began backing up from the window, even before he thought of doing so. While he was backing up, he tripped over one of the legs of another push machine. He didn't take his eyes off the beast in the window, even when he was falling and struggling to get to his feet. Now about 25 feet from the window, the beast began to pound on the window frame and panes of the glass with his fists. That just did not make sense to Jeremy. He wondered why the glass had not broken and then he realized that the glass well, was storm resistant. But that relentless attack by the beast began to crack and spiderweb the glass and one of the panes had began to dent inwards. It was at this point, Jeremy had decided that running for his fucking life was now the most prudent thing 
to do. Now he ran like he'd never run before. Jeremy had run about ten steps when he heard the pane of glass hit the floor with a thud. And then the sounds of metal scraping and clanging on the floor. Now he was running but had no idea where he was going to. As he took fifteen more strides, he heard the beast roar and he knew it was inside now. While he was running, all he could think about was getting out of its reach and he was just about to run past one of the hammer strength pull machines. And it occurred to him he could climb up on the machine and get on top of one of the 15 foot partition walls and then up into the support girders for the running track that was suspended from the ceiling structure. He began climbing and was stepping off the top of the partition wall and up into the girder web when he looked down to see the beast looking up at him and they locked eyes and he knew this thing was not going to stop. I had wanted him, and had wanted him bad. He was the early morning lunch basket. Jeremy began to climb up further into the web of girders to get higher, and as inaccessible as he could possibly get himself out of the reach of this nightmare. When he found a position that felt good, he looked down to where the beast was, and I was not there. He looked around frantically, trying to locate this thing, and it was nowhere to be found. And then, the frightening realization that it was standing on the running track across the facility, which put it at almost 200 feet away. Even at that distance, it was not much comfort. It seemed that, for just a second, it had lost track of him. He was unsure if he should try to get to the ground floor and attempt to get out of the building or just stay put. And then it seemed to lock eyes with him again. And then it jumped from the running track and into the girder web. And it began climbing and maneuvering its way towards him. And Jeremy thought to himself, Okay, this thing, oh, it isn't bringing me cookies. Time to go. And he began to climb over the section wall that separated the push and pull area of the gym floor from the free weight area. And he scaled down to the floor. And Jeremy thought he might have 30 seconds before the thing got to him. But, as he was trying to think of where to go next and what he could use as a weapon, feet hit the concrete floor about 40 feet from him. He turned and then realized this thing was towering, almost 10 feet tall, and was ready to do what it was built for, and had every intention of doing it. He stumbled back about 6 or 7 steps and then he saw on the wall the Olympic crowbar. He grabbed the bar and held it like a barbarian warrior, he yelled at a thing and challenged it to come and get him. The beast took three steps and it was on him. He swung the bar from left to right trying to hit its head. The thing ducked and swiped his left hand with one inch claws and raked them across his right chest and shoulder. The pain was mind numbing but he knew he was engaged in this fight for his life. He summoned all of his strength to reverse the momentum of the bar 180 degrees and swinging the bar left to right, he caught the beast's lower jaw. This spun the thing back to the right, causing it to impact the floor with a thud. And taking advantage of the situation, Jeremy with a bar still in his hands began to beat the creature with the bar unmercifully. And during one of these strikes, the beast grabbed the bar, stopping it in mid-swing with his right hand. And Jeremy could not free the bar from the vice-like grip of the thing. When the beast began to get up off the floor, and then Jeremy let go of the bar and grabbed one of the 25 pound plate weights off the rack. And while the creature was struggling to regain its footing and maintain the bar in its right hand, Jeremy threw the weight plate at the beast's head. Catching it off guard, the plate impacted the face of the creature. And the thing let out a deafening scream of pain as at least two of its facial bones broke in two. The creature rolled back onto the floor and rose to its feet, shaking its head violently and slinging mucus and blood left and right as it stumbled through the doorway, separating the weight room from the machine room and away from Jeremy. Somewhat shocked by this, he quickly thought, what can I make as a weapon that will not put me so close to this fucker? And he glanced down to his claw ripped shoulder. He spotted a weight sling that he used when he would hang a plate weight from him as he was doing his tricep dips, and he had an idea. Jeremy grabbed the sling and a 45 pound plate, and at that moment he heard a noise that sounded like the fucking thing 
was coming back. He ran quickly with the sling on weight plate in his hands into the rock climbing section of the facility. I was massive in scale. The wall was 100 feet in height and was 190 feet in length. It had a near vertical and negative cutbacks and underledge technical climbing and free climbing free for all. And as he was snapping the last clip of the sling with a plate attached, his body began to react to the additional 45 pounds of weight that his body and mind had to manage, and he heard the creature re-enter the weight room. Jeremy sprang into action and began to grab the handholds and place his feet in such a way that he was manoeuvring up the wall with speed and strength. As he was at the 60 foot level, he felt a twinge in his right knee, the one he had injured in the hello crash some 20 years earlier. He pulled himself in close to the wall and tried to take some of the stress of the climb and the extra weight off the knee, and to himself he kept saying, Don't go out. Please, God, don't go out. He heard a noise, and to his terror and shock, there below him stood the beast, mucus and blood dripping from its face, and the look of, you're so fucked, raged across its face. I began to pace and snarl below him, as he began to traverse the face of the wall for about 120 feet. He had climbed up to the 70 foot level, and then the challenging part was in front of him. The next 80 feet of traverse, it would get him up and into the girder web again. It was in a negative and extreme ledge area. Now he had been up there before, but with a safety line. Now he was free climbing without a net, with 45 pounds of extra weight swinging and taking him out of balance with every move. The beast ran and jumped onto the wall and grabbed a hold and then fell back on the floor, shaking its head, almost as if the balance area of its brain was disconnected. It simply could not maintain balance and coordination on the wall. You can't climb, can you, shithead? Okay, Jeremy said to himself. Now he began to traverse the hazardous section of the wall, concentrating on the climb, the wall, and his struggling knee. He lost track of the creature and its whereabouts. Now he was fifty or so feet from where he could re enter the girder web when he heard a noise above him. And peering over the ledge from the safety platform on top of the climbing wall was the creature. The creature was trying to reach over the ledge to grab him, but Jeremy was well out of its 15 foot reach. This infuriated the beast, and it began to beat and pound everything around it. And that is when he saw it. The collar. Well, it had some kind of constant red light on it. This, this was someone's goddamn pet, he thought to himself. And this... Or this just flat pissed him off. He needed to get to the girder web quickly. His strength was dwindling as he moved closer to the web. The creature continued to tear and rip up the well just 30 feet above him. He made it to the girder web and was finally able to get the stress of his knee. Jeremy knew that it was not going to take much more abuse before he lost it. And that it would come at a bad time. Just, just like everything else in his life. It always came at a bad time. As the creature was looking at him over the ledge, Jeremy looked back at it and laughed loudly and said, Come and get me, fucker. He moved through the web and over the sectional wall and into the ceiling above the cardio area. There were over 155 treadmills, stair steppers, ellipticals and bicycles, and there was even a row machine. They were all lined up and ready to use until we heard a thud in the other room, which was created as the creature jumped from the top of the climbing wall and landed on the concrete floor. It was not long before the beast was raging into the cardio area, knocking over equipment and wrecking the place. The best thing about the cardio area is that it had a 75 foot ceiling and was plenty tall enough to keep him safe and allow a special little surprise for the beast. The cardio area was the only area that the running track does not enter, and there was very few ways up and into the web. This was why he wanted to lure the beast here. Now, how to get this thing to stand still long enough directly underneath him, so that his special little surprise could do its work. Now he tried to taunt the creature. All this seemed to do was agitate it to the point of making it attempt to climb the walls. 
As it failed, it became much more agitated and was moving in every direction even more. And so he tried to talk to it sensibly while hanging upside down from the girder web and making eye contact. But well, this didn't work. And so Jeremy thought to himself and then it occurred to him. He wants live bait. How do I pull this off? Jeremy said aloud with a chuckle while still hanging upside down. Well, he pulled himself up into an upright position and looked around and the solution presented itself almost right above him. The steel support strapping for the HAVC ducting was almost always sharp as a knife. Now, he did not relish the fact that he was about to cut his hand, the same hand he would need to get down or to fight his last moments with. And so he readied himself and reached up with his left hand and gripped the strap him. As he squeezed the strap and moved it slightly, he felt it bite his flesh, and then he moved it some more, and before too long, he had an open wound with plenty of bait. He positioned his body and his right hand and unsnapped the clip on the weight sling. As he did so, he gripped the molded handhold on the plate and he held on with all of his remaining strength. All right, one shot at this, one shot, he said to himself. Jeremy let his body fall backwards into the upside-down position, and with his legs wrapped around the girders, he began loosening the grip on his left hand and allowed the blood to flow down his fingertips, and it began to plummet 75 feet, splashing onto the floor. While the beast, almost by instinct, picked up on the scent of blood falling through the air. Its attitude changed from one of rage to almost a peaceful, docile demeanor. I began to walk over to the droplets falling as it stuck out its large 18-inch tongue out of its jagged teeth-filled mouth. The droplets began to collect on the rough mucus-coated tongue. I closed its eyes and almost like it entered a trance-like state. The eyes changed from a dark orange to a almost light grey, and it was savouring the moment. And while this macabre orgy was manifesting itself on the floor below him, no one is ever going to believe this shit. I don't even think I do, he thought to himself. And Jeremy was slowly manoeuvring his right hand and the weight plate into position to but allow it to do its work most effectively. He was moving slowly, as not to agitate or cause the beast to want to move and try to avoid the weight plate as it fell. He loosened his left hand completely, and the flow was more intense, and the creature was absolutely in a trance-like state. When Jeremy said softly to himself, Enjoy your man juice, you son of a bitch. And he released the plate almost directly over the upfacing head of the beast, and the plate fell silently and swiftly, striking the creature in the snout just to the right of its nose. Jeremy saw the edge of the plate almost disappear into the head of the thing, and it made a large indentation in the face of the beast, as it emitted a small, very weak yelp, and it collapsed, falling almost in a graceful manner onto the concrete floor of the facility. And Jeremy pulled a piece of his shirt that he had torn away from his workout shirt and stuck it in his waistband of his shorts. And he wrapped it tightly around his hand and he gripped it with a force from his left hand. As he did this, he pulled himself upright and took some well-deserved deep breaths because he could feel the effects of blood loss and the physical exertion on his body. And while he was catching his breath and wits about him, Jeremy began to plan his way to get down out of his perch. The beast had not moved in over five minutes. He slowly began to move through the girder web and back over to the sectional wall, separating the cardio area from the rock climbing wall. He was able to get a hold of the safety rope and put it through into the cardio section. He was able to sort of mountaineer down the 75 foot wall and was finally able to put his feet on the concrete floor once again. The creature still had not moved, and in the event, if it did, he was in no shape or condition to climb back to his perch. He picked up the weight bar and held it like a club. You know, just in case. With the bar in hand, he approached the thing. It was massive and narrowed the hips, 
but with the muscle strength of a bodybuilder. But its legs were like that of a dog's leg. And what was truly strange, its feet, or they were elongated, but still had large paws. The chest, shoulders and arms were strong and solid. And the hair, not fur, but hair of this thing, well, it was long. Maybe 12 or 18 inches. Jeremy's eyes were drawn to the collar. The red light that was on steadily before was now flashing like a strobe light. Okay, I think somebody got the doggy dead message. He took his right hand and moved the blood-soaked hair and was able to look at the collar closely. Property of Shape Corps, LLC. Grand Rivers, Kentucky. Was embroidered into the nylon band. While the lights flickered and the musky odor that permeated the facility, it seemed to intensify. Just then, he heard a noise and was not sure what it was, but it sounded like it was coming from inside the building. He stepped and limped over to where he could see through the sectional doorway from the cardio area and all the way across to the free weights and push-pull machines areas, over to where he was doing his leg presses and the smashed window. And his heart sank. There, in the frame of the window, was another creature stepping up and into the building and onto the floor. Well, it snarled and growled and shot him a look of, Okay, it's my turn. But at that moment, the sound of a helicopter flying not far off the deck and a powerful spotlight filled the window frame and backlit the beast. Well, it seemed to recognize the sounds and the lights as it grimaced and looked at Jeremy and then bolted out of the window with the spotlight following it. And Jeremy almost didn't have time to be scared. He'd already reasoned that if something else was going to happen, then he would just have to manage it the best his current physical state could bear. The sound of suppressed automatic gunfire shook him back to reality, if you could call this reality. And then gunfire that he had not heard before, as what seemed to be a four-man fire team began sweeping in the facility. He was told to get down on the floor and to hold his hands and arms out away from his body. He complied. After all, he didn't want to get gunned down after surviving what he just did. Now he was taken to one of the many ambulances that were brought to the scene. However, none of these vehicles were from his hometown fire department. In fact, not one of the vehicles on scene had any markings or jurisdiction insignia at all. The medical technicians that were treating him worked quickly and very efficiently. It was plain to see that these guys were no slouches at their jobs or their focus. The tech had his chest and shoulder scratches and skin tears cleaned and stitched and dressed. And the wound on his left hand was seen too by the first tech and then what looked like his rank emblems, a chief warrant officer three, who was actually a physician. He checked his hand wound to make sure there was no nerve damage in his hand. And both the chief and the tech stitched and dressed his wound. Now the desire to know information was just too much and Jeremy asked the tech, What town are you guys from? The only answer that the tech would give him was that they were a private initiative dedicated to helping with special situations that arise. Okay, Jeremy said. What is that thing that tried to kill me? Well, the tech responded that this is a question best put to that man right there, as the tech pointed to the tall, almost six foot four inch man. He was acting very much in charge and in the know. The man looked at him and the tech motioned to the man and he acknowledged that he would be right with him. The man approached Jeremy sitting up on the gurney and extended his hand and shook Jeremy's right hand and said, Ah, you're quite the warrior, Sergeant Hicks. By all rights, we should be picking you up with a sponge. Jeremy replied, ah, Happy to disappoint you, whoever you are. Oh, where are my manners? I'm Colonel Tate. I run this outfit. All right, Colonel. What the fuck are those things? Jeremy exclaimed with force. Ah, those things are damn near the perfect killing machine. And they've been around here for an exceptionally long time. Tate replied. We are researching them to see if we can make them better or more controllable. 
and these specimens escaped containment and, well, we had to get them back in their kennels, so to speak. Tate said very matter-of-factly. Look, people need to know about these things. I can't believe that the government allows this kind of operation. No one of these things are roaming around out here and not letting the public be aware of them, Jeremy stated with intent. And why would you have us do, Sergeant? Tell the public that monsters exist, that werewolves roam the land, and how would you manage that chaos? Tate countered. Look, Sergeant, I know how you feel. I have been in this job for 13 years now, and I have seen things that would sicken a sewer leech. The public is better off not knowing anything, and being allowed to swim in blissful ignorance, Tate said calmly. What happens when these things kill people? Jeremy said with anger. We happen, Sergeant. We clean up the mess and put a pleasant spin on it, spray the odorizer on it and make it shine. Tate lamented. Unbelievable. Jeremy said, shaking his head. Now, Sergeant, I hope we can count on your cooperation in this matter. I'm not in the business of leaving loose ends. I would like to think that we could have a working relationship. Yeah, maybe you can come work with us. Well, it's apparent you know how to handle yourself. And you're a clear thinker under pressure. We could really use more warriors like you. No, no fucking way, dude. Jeremy snapped. Okay, so it's going to be the carrot or the stick approach. Okay, the carrot. You go on with your life and say absolutely nothing at all to anyone about this and you will find an extra 35000 in your bank account tonight. And in your retirement pay at the end of the month, an extra 3000 for the rest of your life. We will fix any debt collections that are on your credit card report and you will never have to pay child support. Ever. You follow? And now, the stick. We will start augmenting your Department of Defense personnel jacket that will disqualify you from your retirement permanently. And then the Internal Revenue Service will be standing on your bars 24-7. The Federal Bureau of Investigations will open a fraud case against you. And warrants on charges you never heard of will appear like a bad rash you picked up from a whorehouse. And then, one night, because of all the stress you've been under... You will take your own life due to your feelings of guilt for causing the deaths of your team buddies in war. Sergeant, we have done this before, time and time again, and we're really good at it. Come on, Sergeant, take the carrot. I can get that you don't want to work with a motherfucker like me. I get it. Let me make this situation a little better for you. Take pleaded with Hicks. And Jeremy didn't like it, but... He agreed to the carrot, and he and Tate signed the agreement that afternoon, before he was transferred to the hospital for further treatment. Now, Jeremy spent four days in the hospital, and the news reports of what transpired at the fitness facility was that a rabbit swamp bear broke into the facility and attacked a couple of the gym members. The gym is closed pending an insurance investigation to render liability for such a tragic occurrence. The incident was rendered as an act of God and no liability was assigned. However, the renovations were of such an extent and expense that the owners decided not to reopen the facility. And within 20 days, it was raised to the ground and nothing but the very large concrete slab was left. Jeremy returned to his home and began to contact contractors to build a 25 foot by 35 foot addition to his house, where he would soon begin working out at home. He had never seen or heard from Colonel Tate again, and that suited him just fine. About six months later, Jeremy had started researching through internet radio shows or podcasts about these strange beings they call cryptids, and these particular ones are known as dogmen. Now, apparently, they are becoming more and more prevalent in the world. About 18 months later, Jeremy had finished one of his workout sessions up in the morning, and he was recovering in the comfort of the early May morning. He was in the midst of making a great vegetable garden, and had a 100 foot by 50 foot area freshly cultivated. He was admiring his last evening's work, and then he saw the trail of tracks. The tracks walked up out of the drainage ditch, which was basically a small wash, 
that was covered in brush and small trees. The tracks crossed the garden, and the prints were almost four inches deep in the freshly cultivated soil, and were about eleven inches in diameter. They led up to the back of his work shed, and then he heard his cell phone ringing. He went to walk over to the table to pick it up, as a large, black, very tall figure rose to its feet quietly behind him. The cell phone fell into the soft grass. Hey, Sergeant, this is Colonel Tate. I just wanted to give you a heads up on Specimen 1642 Bravo. I'd escaped again. This was the mate to the one you killed. And she might be looking for you. I hope all is well. Later, warrior. 72 hours later, Jeremy Higgs was listed as missing and whereabouts unknown. Robbery seems to be the motive. Several of his personal effects were missing, including his cell phone. Wow, 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 wow. Suddenly another one. Wow. Absolutely chest pounding and spine tingling tale there from the incredible Edward Ed Smith. Big thank you, Ed, as always, for your incredible input and support. Really do get so excited when I see an email from yourself. We really never know where these stories are going to take us. Great concept and a very refreshing concept at that. Well, guys and girls, another one bites the dust. Please, as ever, let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. Why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you're an aspiring writer or would just like to have a crack at things like myself, then please do get in touch with me at the usual email as on screen, which is DMT Forest to Fear at Gmail. Com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope everybody had a wonderful weekend with friends or family, relaxing in the sun, nothing but good vibes and good food. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.